Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come into this, these moments where we open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth, that you would transform us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Last week, we launched into a new sermon series called The Path, and we looked at a principle that is an unbreakable principle in this universe and if we try to break this principle, it winds up breaking us. And this principle that we looked at, it goes something like this, that our direction determines our destination. And so today we're going to take that principle and we're going to go just a little bit farther with it. And the, the principle of the path goes like this. It's your direction, not your intention that determines your destination. It's your direction, not your, your wishes or your hopes and dreams for your life and your wishful thinking, but, but it's, your, it's your direction that determines your destination. Whether you're rich or poor, good looking or not, or whatever your situation is in life, this principle applies to, to every single one of us here today. Let's say that that your family or mine, we want to go down to Galveston, to the beach. Like, hey, man, let's, let's go get away for a little bit. And so we, we get a, a bag, and we, we put our swimsuits and towels in there, sunscreen. And man, we're going to the beach. All right, let's load up. Let's all get in the car. We pile in there. It's time to go. And we get out there to Interstate 35. And instead of going south, we turn north. And we start going north for about 8 to 10 hours, and we're like, where's the beach? Where, where's Galveston? This, this looks like Wichita, Kansas up here. Here's the deal. We had an intention, a hope to get to the beach, but we set our direction in the wrong place, and we wound up somewhere else. And that's the, the principle of the path. And so today in our lives, just like in, in when we are navigating geographically, we got to set our direction in our lives. And many times we can get off of the path, don't we? We can, get, we can get lost. And so I want to share with you a few thoughts on what I call the, the art of lostness. The first one is this, is we don't get lost on purpose. Think about it. It's really, it's hard to, to get lost on purpose. You, it's hard to do it. Now, the second one is this, that we're lost before we know we're lost. And that's true, we're like over here, because if we weren't, we could just like, we could back up to the place where we got lost and then we, we, we would be unlost. So we, we get lost before we, we know we're lost. And the third one is this, men go faster when we're lost. <laughs> there's, it's just, I, there's no explanation for it, but it happens. And the last one is this, is that we wind up where the road we're on ends up. We wind up where the road we're on ends up. The principle of the path that we're going to look at today, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. We know this when it, when it comes to driving, but for some reason, that we, it's tough to apply this principle in other areas of our lives, in areas that I like to call the, the Ali's. Let me explain this. The Ali's or the financially. He's like, think about this. You're like, you know, I know I need to, to take part of my paycheck and start saving up for retirement, but right now I got so many bills, I'm just going to wait until later. I'm just going to, I got to stay on this other path. How about professionally? Like, I get out of high school, I'm like, ah, I got to, I know I need to go get that degree, but man, I've got this job over here, and I think I'm going to just do this for a while because I like the money over here. It's like, great. How about um, relationally, you know, like, hey, I know that uh, I need to marry a, a nice young lady, a godly lady that like my mother, you know, and all this, but, but I'll get to that later. Right now, I'm going to run with this other crowd for a little while. How, here's one I made up. Look over here. marriage Ali. Like, you can put this on everything. parenting Ali. Like, these are the Ali's in our life where we, we can get off of the, the, the path, and if we don't set our direction and get on it, we're going to wind up in some place else than what we wanted to be. And so the challenge that we find today is that, that oftentimes in our life, there's a, there's a disconnect between our intention and the direction that we choose to go in. And so today, I know that I don't want, and I know that, that you don't want, and our, our Heavenly Father doesn't want us to end up in a place down the road, a place of pain and of, of hurt, 
a place of disappointment and a, and a destination of all the, the, the would ofs the, the should ofs what would it have been like, the what ifs, and he's calling us now into a better life, a better path. And so the principle is that it's your direction, not your intention, not just your hopes and your wishful thinking that is going to determine your destination. In this series that we're in, we're in the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs was, was given to us by Solomon. He wrote most of the book about 900 B.C. He was the, the third king of Israel, very, very wise man. And he was wise. He was smart in, on paper. He was book smart. But later in his life, we see that he, he forsook he, even his own teaching, and he didn't end well. But, but God used him to, to, to write down this information for us in Proverbs. Why? To give us some tools to live a wise life. And even in the first chapter of the book of Proverbs, Solomon tells us why he is giving us this material. Let's take a look at what he says in verse 2. He says this, it was written for obtaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, for doing what is right and just and fair, and for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Wow. Who wouldn't want all of, all of that in your life? Like, see, God superintended. He oversaw the, the composition of this book we call Proverbs and so that we would become wise and we would live well. In this, this section, in these verses that we just read, Solomon uses a word twice that we don't use very often, but it's a great word. And if we could ever just master this skill it would so improve our lives and make us so much better. See if you can find the word in these two verses. It's, it's used in a couple of variations. Prudent. Yes, the word is prudent. And here's what this means. To be prudent means to know what to do, to exercise good judgment, and to have common sense. To know what to do, exercise good judgment, have common sense. This word prudent is, it's, it's not a word that we use all the time. I mean, think about it. I don't, I don't go to my wife and go, sweetheart, oh man, your prudence really gets my heart fluttering. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't, but it's an important word and Solomon used it many times throughout Proverbs. The opposite of being someone who's prudent, Solomon calls them simple, simple-minded, simple, foolish, unwise, and whatever you are today, you don't want to be simple. Listen to what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 12. He says this, Fools, a fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Have you ever been insulted? Some simple people, they let their emotions get the, the best of them, and they get, they get mad, and sometimes they might just fly into a rage over the smallest little thing. They spout off, and they begin to, they complain when things don't go their way, but the Bible says that a prudent man controls themselves, and, and the Spirit of God is, is his Christ is living in us. He's, he's developing our character and our patience and our self-control, and the Bible says that the prudent person takes things in, in stride. Here's another one example. In, in Chapter 14 says this, a simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. You see, the, the simple-minded, they get, they get easily fooled and led astray, but the Bible says the prudent, uses, they use their intellect, their mind, and the wisdom that God has given. They think and they evaluate. Man, can you imagine if we mastered this in our lives, how much easier our lives would be? Imagine this that God is working inside of us, building this prudence in us as we heed his call. Listen to what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 22, another example of this word. He says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Hmm. Let's look at one last one, Proverbs 27, 12. Let's read this one together as a congregation. It says, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Wait a second. Did he change the, the slide? Like, wait, did, wasn't that just the one I just read before? 
what's going on here? Did God, what? This verse, this proverb, God put it in here two times. Why did he do this in all of the proverbs? He, he put the same one in here twice. He knows that he gave us the book of Proverbs to be smarter at living. And he put this one in here because we doubly need to know this lesson. And we're going to dive into it today. That the prudent, they see danger and take refuge. But the simple, keep going and pay the penalty. So let's, let's dive into this. Because last week we learned the importance of being on the path. And the next logical question would be then, how do you choose the right path? How do you figure out which one you should be on and which one that you should step off of? This proverb right here today is telling us the, that the primary difference between the prudent and the simple is not what they see, but how they respond to what they see. You see it? That the, they both see the same thing. The prudent see danger and take refuge. The simple see danger and they keep on going. They both see it, but one responds and, and changes courses, and the other one just keeps on going in that direction of toward danger, just hoping that it will never arrive in their life. The simple are kind of like, like, like an ostrich who, who buries his head in the sand and thinks, if I can't see danger and things around me, that it'll never see me, and, 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 and that, it, that disaster will never come and if I can't see it. You can see why Solomon called these people simple. So how do you choose the right path? The prudent make course corrections. We all need a course correction in our lives. We all get off the path, and today, wherever you are, it's time to evaluate your path. We, the prudent make course corrections. Man, there's some people who can, you've seen them, that they can just look at a map and kind of get the lay of the, the terrain and the roads and memorize it, and then they can get in the car, and man, they've got like kind of on this internal compass, like north, uh, and they can just go, and you're like, wow, that's cool. Whatever the, the opposite of that is, is what I was when I was like 18 years old trying to drive. <laughs> Maybe you've been there too. Like, I remember I was 18, and some friends of mine, they, their parents said, we got a lake cabin down in Granbury, and we want to do like a senior, like get together. We're going to have a hot dog s'more. Like, everybody come down there. And so my friends, like four or five of us, they go, Jet, you drive. I'm like, okay, I got this. We lived up in North Richland Hills over there off of 820. And right there, I kept seeing this sign all the time for Highway 377. And the sign, you've probably seen these, where it said Denton Granberry on the same sign, okay? And so I'm thinking, hey, I know where Denton is. Let's go, man. Let's load up. So we get in there. I start heading toward Denton. And, like, we're going and going. And my friends are like, dude, where's the lake, man? Like, where, are we there yet? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to go faster. Huh? And so I finally pulled in to a gas station. And this poor lady in there, she's shaking her head like, oh, my goodness. She goes, Granberry's like an hour and a half the other way. You need a course correction. I'm like, oh, get in the car. We, we were flying down there trying to get to this party. We show up, and the mom goes, I'm sorry, man. The s'mores are gone. There's some, like, stale queso over there and some flat Dr. Pepper if you want it. My friends were like, you idiot. So I needed a course correction. You know, in life, it's easier said than done, isn't it? Many times we need to, to step off of the, the path and make a course correction and get off of the wrong path. Being prudent in our lives says this, that this behavior, this, this habit, this relationship, this whatever it might be in my life is leading me somewhere where I'm just going to get hurt and experience pain, and I need to get off of this path and make a course correction. So unlike the prudent, the simple, the Bible says, keep right on going. A prudent person sees that this relationship is in, in danger, and they, they get help. They go to counseling. They pray about it. They seek the Lord. The simple just keeps right on going into disaster. The prudent looks at their finances, and they say, we can't continue to spend like this. We're going more and more into debt. we got to get a budget. we got to get under control. The simple just keep going and ignoring it, just caution to the wind, and they're heading toward a cliff that God is calling you to change paths. And he says, listen up. It's time to make a course correction. Just so we're clear on this, the second half of this proverb has a warning. It says this, the simple keep going, and then it goes on to say that they pay the penalty. 
What do they pay the penalty for? It's for refusing to, to act on what they, they see. You see, they fail to see a connection between their choices of today and their experiences of tomorrow, and they overlook the fact that every path has a destination. But here's the really the, the sad part about a simple person who, is, who pays a penalty, is oftentimes it's not just them that pays the penalty, that they, they drag others in there with them, that their spouses feel the effect, their children, their, their family, their, their co-workers can feel the effect of their misjudgment. And the simple, they think that I'm going to just continue to drive toward this cliff that I know is in front of me, but, but I know somehow, I don't know what, but some miraculous thing is going to happen, and, and, and all of a sudden I'm going to like come into a windfall, and it's going to change everything into my life. And, and many times they just ignore it and go sailing right over the cliff. The simple just keep on going. So how do you choose the right path? Because today we all need to a course correction, and we all need to realize this, that the mistakes of our past, the, the, the paths that we've taken in the, in the past don't have to define where we are right now. One of the greatest stories in the Bible of, of a course correction was what Steve just read just a little bit earlier about Saul. You remember in the book of Acts, Saul was, was he thought it was his mission to annihilate the New Testament church. He was rounding up people and putting them in prisons. He was killing Christians. He was throwing them out into the, the lions, and he was so zealous for this. Then one day, Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, and he speaks into his heart, and, and Paul, he could, have, he could have ignored it, but he listened, and God transformed his life. Paul went on to a new course and he aligned himself with the Spirit of God, and he began the greatest evangelist and author of most of our New Testament. An incredible course correction. How do you make a course correction? The first thing is this, that you need to take action. You need to take action. You need to step off of this one path that you're on and get on to another one. But if we're real honest today, that's, that's not easy, is it? It's tough. It's tough to, because why? We're creatures of habit. We get into a momentum in our lives. And like, you know what? My, I just continually, I stretch the truth on things. And so this becomes part of who I am. And, and it's just so hard to, to change course. Or, or over here, this, like every day I just go and I click on this certain thing on the internet. And I'm just in the habit of this. And it's hard. But I mean, Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you into a new creation. And it's time for you to get off the old path and out of the old patterns and, and to step on to a new path. You know what? Jesus is calling us to a, a new start, to a, a better path, to a path of life. Listen to what he tells us in Matthew chapter 7. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Oh, my friend, he wants life for you, and he's calling you today. He's awakening faith. Maybe for the first time, and somebody in this room is, is experiencing the Holy Spirit moving and calling you because Jesus wants you to live better, and he wants you to go on a great adventure with him of a better life. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to take action. We've got to step off the old path and onto the new. And the second thing is this. You need to trust your guide. Why do I need a, a guide? If you're going down a road, you need a guide, someone who's been down this path before who can point out the potholes and, the, and all the pitfalls and the things that are going to trip you up and the dangers that are coming. Jesus, he says, I've given you a guide, but here's the deal that we're going to realize today is we've got to be real careful when we're choosing our guide, because there's many voices out there. There's many guides that, that want to step up like they have the answers and they have the truth. But here's what the Bible says, what Jesus tells us in John 16. He says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit that lives within us. And he says, you don't have to be confused and wonder about the direction of your life. He says, I've given you my spirit and my word. And the word of God says that it will be a lamp unto our feet and what? A light unto our path. 
You know, some people are looking way, way out, and I don't understand. God, why don't you reveal what's way out there? And he said, no, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal to you right here. I'm going to illuminate your steps here, a light under your path. So you may not know what's coming, but I'm going to show you right now how to walk down the path that I'm laying out for you. My spirit will be your guide. Have you ever been on a, a river rafting trip? Man, back years ago, I got an opportunity to go uh, on a river rafting trip down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. It was a nine-day trip, man. It was incredible. We would hit the rapids every night. We were camping out on the side. Well, we had these, these two guys, man, these big burly guys like, like Grizzly Adams. Ah, they got like the beers. Oh, strong dude, muscles everywhere. These dudes had been down this river so many times. It was awesome. Like, they could look at this stuff. We're, we're going toward it, and they go, everybody grab the ropes, hang on. And there's boiling cauldron of waves and rapids and rocks, and we're like, oh, no, we're going to die. But then they know how to read the rocks, like where the boulders and the way that the currents would play off of them, and they knew how to guide us through there. Man, we had a blast and water splash, and we get to the other side. Ah, if we tried to go there by ourselves, we would have just smashed in there and probably all drowned. We had a, the guides that, that knew the way, and they, they, they guided us through there. And Jesus Christ says, I am your guide. And I have walked this road that you're walking. I'm not leaving you as orphans. He says, I've gone through every temptation that is known to man, and I've come through. And so now I know how to sympathize and empathize with you, and I'm going to provide a way out for you. I went to the cross to bear all of those times that you got off the path, and I died for that. And I was buried, and he said, but I didn't stay there. I rose again. Why? So I could defeat death. And so when you come to the end of your life, and you're at the, the raging river that's in front of you, you don't have to be afraid. Jesus says, I'm going to safely guide you across because I've conquered death. And I'm going to lead you into the presence of your holy and perfect Father. Cling to me. I'm your guide. Church, imagine this today. If if all of us were to align the paths of our lives when we get on, like how much love would be in this church if we were all living and, and his spirit is inside of us and it would just overflow out of here into our community and people would begin to experience Christ in our, our lives. What if, what if you lived in such a way on, uh, that, that your reputation, that, that your morals were what, what people thought about you was exactly what you wanted them to think about you and exactly what God wanted him to see in you. Because why? Because you had the courage to make a course correction. A friend of mine once told me, he said, man, my goal in life is to become the man that my dog thinks I am. <laughs> like you walk in, you have a bad day, and it's just, ah. Our Heavenly Father says, my goal for you is to, for you to become the child of God that I have died for, that I want you to become, and I'm going to be your guide, and, and I want you to set your direction on me, and not just your wishful thinking, because your direction determines your destination. Today, church, I want to challenge you to take action. As you go out this week to, to open the guidebook to Proverbs and begin to read through, and you're going to be amazed at the insight that God is going to speak into your heart. Spend some time in prayer. Realign yourself with where he wants you to go. And so, church, I want to call you as you're a grandparent, as you're a, a parent, a student, a child, to, to join us here at St. John on an incredible journey. And we call it the faith path. I'm calling you today to get started on the faith path with us. And inside of your order of service, you're going to find a trifold thing that looks like this called faith path. Because here's the deal today. We know that you want your children to grow up in the faith and know more about Scripture and about God. But here's the deal. The challenge is there's so many voices out there, so many other paths that kids can get on. And so it's hard. And where do I even turn for resources? We want to come alongside of you and help you to teach your children from the time from birth all the way until they launch out from college and go on. And we're going to help you step by step intentionally to do that. We're going to provide resources for you. You might have received an email this week, and if you didn't, we want to get you on the list. Give us your email address at the connection counter, 
And so next week, you'll be able to go to the Connected Home Center right out here and pick up a packet that's going to have stuff that you can do intentionally with your family to help build faith into the next generation. Imagine this. Imagine years down the road as you look back in your family and you just see the faith that was built because you had the courage to say, God, I want to align my family with your, your path. Take just a moment to watch a really short video about Faith Path right now. As a parent, we have the blessing of walking alongside our children as they grow and mature. And in most areas of our children's life, we have suggestions and guidance on that development and growth. Physically, as a new mom, I remember being inundated with graphs and charts of what percentile my child was supposed to fall in line with in terms of weight and height and even head circumference. And experts recommend when our children are supposed to begin rolling and walking academically, intellectually, when our child should begin speaking, and how many words they should know at certain ages and stages. And as our child develops and grows, the different subjects and skills that they should begin just really growing and developing in. There seems to be recommendations throughout our child's entire lives, but really there seems to be very little guidance on the spiritual development for our children. And really this is the most important one. This is the one that's gonna have eternal impact on our children's lives. The Faith Path was created to guide you in giving your child a firm foundation of faith. And more than just suggestions of when, we really wanted to help you with the how. And so you're gonna find ideas, recommended resources, as you prepare for certain milestones in your child's life, and as you begin to focus on particular spiritual disciplines and practices. You're gonna hear from experts and families that have gone before you. We pray that the Faith Path would equip you would challenge you, and would encourage you as you guide your child's spiritual journey one step at a time. So what exactly is the Faith Path? The Faith Path is designed to coach parents through the process of nurturing faith in their children one step at a time. We'll do this by recommending a focus on specific practices and specific milestones at certain ages. The church will provide you with a specially designed kit for each step that includes a training video, a simple guide, fun starter ideas, and best of resource recommendations that will help you gain greater confidence. We've drawn wisdom from both experts on each topic and from other families who are a little further down the path. We look forward to partnering with you through the parenting years, one step at a time. As you leave today out in the, the lobby, there's going to be s some baskets of stones that you can pick up. I want to invite you, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, anyone, pick up one of these stones. And what you can do is this is going to help remind you that you're on the faith path. You can put it on your mantle, maybe on your nightstand, that remind you to do these activities to help build into the life of those you love faith. Because here's the truth, church, that it's our prayer that we would raise up a generation that's not just a generation of lukewarm believers, but that we would raise up here and God would do his work in lives, that we would raise up a generation of passionate followers of Jesus Christ for his honor and his glory. Amen.